Pakistan's Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari. Minister, thank you very much for your time. It's good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Minister, let me start with getting some clarity from you when it comes to those energy supplies, potentially from Russia. When I spoke to the Prime Minister just a few months ago, he was certain that you were going to get those supplies. When could we see the first deliveries that could help your economy? Um, as far as our energy supplies are concerned, as you're aware, everybody after the fallout of the Ukraine war and the associated sanctions have been facing tough economic times, high inflation, high uh, gas at the pump, and that's the same for Pakistan. As far as any conversations with uh, Russia are concerned vis-a-vis -vis, uh, energy supplies, we're not at a stage uh, where we'll be getting, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, any of those uh, supplies anytime soon. We are desperate to, to uh, fulfill our energy needs and are discussing uh, with a whole host of countries, but that's not um, in, in the, Im the immediate uh, crisis that we're in right now with uh, the, uh, the, the catastrophic effect of the flooding that uh, washed away 10% of my country's GDP at $30 billion. The blow up back from the uh, Ukraine war, but also uh, from the COVID pandemic and the fall of Kabul has been uh, incredibly difficult. As you mentioned, we're in conversations with the IMF. We'd actually agreed to, to terms with the IMF just as the flooding started. Mm. And now I find and, and now I find ourselves, we find ourselves in this incredibly difficult positions where we're trying to manage our macroeconomic indicators with the IMF and provide the imminent relief for the people that is still necessary now in Pakistan and plan forward for our reconstruction and rehabilitation. Unfortunately, the cameras have gone, the attention has disappeared, but there's still floodwaters in many areas of my country. Mm. Many, many people are still, um, you know, they, they can't go back home or they can't go to school, or they can't uh, go back to farm. And there's an incredible humanitarian climate a catastrophe. Let's talk a little bit about that attention that you're talking about globally, because when it comes to the conversations with the IMF for this next loan, uh, the tranche of, of the next uh, loans to come, they've been a little bit slow. So what's happening there? What's the delay and when could we see agreement? No, I, I won't be able to say whether there, there's a delay or not. I mean, the details that, that the finance minister can tell you. Uh, I believe that it is important for us. Uh, obviously, we all agree. The entire unity government agrees that it's important for us to deal with international financial institutions. We want to see the fundamental reform that's required for the overall health of our economy. But at the moment, our number one priority has to be helping these people who are in extreme, extreme uh, distress in the short, medium and long term. That's the path forward for our economy. Because as we rebuild, as we rehabilitate, as we uh, create the environment so that these people can get back on their feet, then they'll be able to not only contribute to my economy, not only contribute to our agriculture, but also help meet the world's food security or insecurity. Minister, mm -hmm. let's talk a little to... bit about those more specific uh, conditions and, and help that you could get from countries. What conversations are you having with Saudi Arabia? Could we see a fresh loan deposit or perhaps investments as well? So again, there, there, there are multiple phases to our recovery. The, the the initial and still ongoing phases because of the scale of the tragedy is the relief. And for the relief phase, we've had incredible support from the international community, from our, uh, from our region, uh, from the Middle East, and of course, uh, from America. Going forward, we'll be holding a reconstruction and rehabilitation conference co-hosted by the UN Secretary General and the Prime Minister of Pakistan, which will give the opportunity for all our partners to join with us uh, in our reconstruction and rehabilitation efforts. The opposition leader Imran Khan has talked about dissolving two provincial assemblies. Does this contribute to political instability? Do you see potentially this contributing to momentum for elections ahead of time? So as far as um, elections ahead of time or any other political point is concerned, I believe it's, it's extremely unfortunate that at a time when a third of the country uh, was underwater 
and I've given, uh, you know, a large part of my home province of Sindh and Balochistan, but also provinces that Mr. Khan is, is, is still governing to this day, be it the largest province of Punjab. There are southern districts who are devastated by these floods. The southern um, areas of Bukhtunkhwa that Mr. Khan has been ruling for the past 14 years, they were devastated by these floods. Gilgit Baltistan, where he has government, they were also impacted by the monsoon rains. It should have been not just my priority, but everybody's priority to step up, to leave partisan politics aside and unite to meet this challenge. Unfortunately, Mr. Khan has been throwing an eighth month tantrum that he has not been prime minister uh, for these many months and distracting not only from the domestic uh, not only the domestic media conversation moves on, but the international uh, media conversation moves on. When the COVID pandemic hit, if I was thinking as sinisterly, as, as Machiavellian as Mr. Khan was, I would have used that as an opportunity to, to protest, to read these sorts of uh, movements and try and remove Mr. Khan then. But at that point in time, I stood up in front of my country and said, I have my differences with Mr. Khan, but we're facing a calamity and he is our prime minister. Unfortunately, uh, for the few months that he's been up op in opposition, we face this historic crisis. Uh, and throughout it, uh, we haven't seen that sort of cooperation from Mr. Khan. Prime Minister, India has called your remarks on PM Modi uncivilized. Do you stand by those remarks? Uh, Ma'am, uh, I was referring to a historical reality. Uh, the remarks I used weren't my own. I did not call, I did not invent the term uh, butcher of Gujarat for Mr. Modi. The Muslims in India following the Gujarat riots uh, used that term uh, for Mr. Modi. I believe that I was referring to historical fact, and they believe that repeating history is a personal insult. Um, if I was incorrect, then uh, I, I don't, the, what, what has happened today, it's been a two days since my remark, is a, a member of Mr. Modi's party has announced a 20 million rupee bounty on my head. So I don't think that the best way to disprove the fact that Mr. Modi is the butcher of Gujarat is to adopt such extreme steps. Uh, but Minister, uh, your remarks have caused uproar both in India and also in your country. You have a minister who's actually threatening a nuclear war on India at this oh, point. Where do relations go from here? Okay, so first of all, as far as my uh, remarks are concerned, absolutely, they resulted in protests all over India, and that's their right. I think you cross the line when you officially announce a head money for your neighboring countries foreign minister's assassination. I think that's 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 a line that we're normalizing and crossing. And the fact that we get to move on from that question uh, is, is troubling for me when I'm engaging with Bloomberg, which is such an important international uh, forum. As far as nuclear war, no one has threatened nuclear war. A minister did say that Pakistan is a responsible nuclear country and should be treated as such. That was not uh, a, a, a threat for nuclear war. No one thinks nuclear war is an appropriate reaction. I tend to believe that if, if I'm quoting somebody else and speaking about a historical fact that Mr. Modi would prefer we forget about, the response shouldn't be to threat a threat of assassination. So let's talk a little bit about global cooperation and perhaps the support that you need to see in order for your economy to recover. Give us a little bit more detail about the next conversations that you're having. You have talked to us a lot about uh, global cooperation, about the need for that capital to come to Pakistan, and yet we don't really have a clear timeline when it comes to those IMF negotiations, when it comes to potential more loans or investments coming from the likes of Saudi Arabia and others, and even the Paris Club, for example. So I think that uh, the January 9th um, uh, rehabilitation and restructuring conference that I referred to in my response to your other question, in which the Prime Minister of Pakistan and the UN Secretary General will be a co-hosting an event for our for in the international community to come forward and join Pakistan will be an important start, but it will just be that. It'll be a start for us to come 
up with $16 billion of financing will take time. What's important for me is to get the process started, to get the work going so that people can start rebuilding their homes, go back to school, get back to work, and that'll make uh, the rest of the process easier, e easy, easier for us. Obviously, the scale of the catastrophe has been such that we can't imagine that we're going to get through this uh, uh, overnight. This is, there's, there's, there's a short, medium, and long-term plan here that Pakistan is following. Foreign Minister, great to have you with us. We appreciate your time. Bilawal Bultoza Dari there, the Foreign Minister of Pakistan.